apologies before we start. Dr. James Meadway is unable to attend now due to a very last minute issue, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, but we still have two great speakers. Um, <coughs> um, so, just before we begin, I wanted to give you a tiny overview of what Corbynomics is. Um, obviously, we all know since the election of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, this has reignited a fierce debate over policies that were once considered misguided and outdated. Um, but with weak recovery and widening inequality, these are now being taken not just seriously, but endorsed by a number of prominent economists. So, Corbynomics uh, centres around ending austerity. Um, through a number of different channels. So some policies are people's quantitative easing, which would see the Bank of England uh, printing money to invest in public projects rather than to support banks. More progressive taxation, including a reduction in tax breaks to corporations and a crackdown on tax evasion, forms a key <coughs> pillar. Um, and other suggested policies include a maximum wage and the renationalisation of the railways um, and certain banks. So, to help navigate us through the debates, we have uh, Professor Anastasia Nazakalova as our first speaker. She is Director of the Political Economy Research Centre at City University London, and she is a renowned expert in the fields of international political economy, financial crises, and globalisation. Um, she has also recently become a member of the Economic Advisory Committee to the Labour Party. However, uh, we should remember that uh, Professor Anastasia is speaking for herself and not for the Labour Party today. So, uh, please welcome our first speaker. Thank you very much, Emily, for this very um, glamorous introduction. Thank you all for being here on a Friday night. It's really amazing to see so many young faces and um, generally a, a nice turnout. Um, I'm really happy to be speaking to students. I, I, I consider it as a privilege. It's much more usually entertaining than speaking to your colleagues. And uh, sorry. <laughs> And uh, something that I, I, yes, Emily already mentioned, I'm here primarily as an academic rather than as a member of the advisory panel. So um, don't assume that, um, that there is too much agreement or behind the thinking uh, of the new economic policy. And I also should say that it is sti still being developed. Um, that would be the, the best characterization of of the package. My area of expertise is the financial system and financial crisis, financial innovation, banks and financial regulation. So to respond to the invitation, I, I was trying to, to, to see what would be the best title. And then I came up with an idea that I need to talk about debt, finance and economic downturns or economic cycles, um, quantitative easing and beyond, because that is the, the real strategic issue that unites the lessons from the financial or banking crisis with the macroeconomic recovery, political stability, and economic security. The major message of my talk is that um, Corbyn's proposals, or really uh, Labour Party proposals, Corbynomics, in terms of people's QE, or how to use public resources, public liquidity, for um, uh, growth or investment or the people, are really not that radical, and that is the, the very simple lesson, you can, you can stop listening now because the, the rest will be fairly straightforward and boring. Okay, uh, why quantitative easing and why suddenly um, it's a major issue that is occupying various regulators at national and international levels, policymakers, banks, and is a big worry for the financial markets. Because it was the central banks really that became the champions <coughs> of crisis management. If there was one institution um, or one type of institution that really worked their way through and was very adequate in responding to the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 and 2009, it, it was the central banks in North Atlantic economies. To the extent that a lot of academics starting to talk about central bank capitalism as opposed to industrial capitalism, financial capitalism or technological capitalism, we now live in, in time where central banks matter much more than governments. Central banks really lay the foundations of economic um, growth, prosperity, orientation for financial markets and industry. Pretty much the rest may not really matter in times of crisis. Um, there are also some quantitative estimation of how much they contributed. And th these figures are above the bailouts, uh, liquidity provision to the markets, bailouts for individual banks and corporations. This is 
overall the sums of quantitative easing programs that were, that were either launched um, as a whole package or gradually in major advanced economies. So you can see that in um, Europe, in the UK, in the US and in Japan, there are hundreds of trillions of dollars being pumped into the economy through various channels, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. In Europe, it's, it's more difficult. But there is a lot of cash being spent on the economy. The problem is that um, this cash may not have fulfilled its purpose so far. The idea behind quantitative easing uh, is not very ad hoc. It was applied as a policy tool in this time, but it does have strong theoretical and historical roots in economic literature and in history of economic thought. Perhaps the most vocal advocate or proposer of the idea of quantitative easing was Hyman Minsky, whose, follow, whose scholarship I greatly respect, um, who, because he was always interested whether a great depression can happen in a financially advanced economy of the 1980s, 1970s United States, and this was a very <coughs> liberal, very innovative, financially innovative economy, um, he concluded that, yes, there are all the preconditions for a recession or a great depression to repeat itself. And these preconditions are mostly to do with financial innovation and the way risk being uh, taken up in the financial cycle. And in order to avoid the structural consequences of the great recession, of the great 1930s crisis, there should be a big bank and a big government, the two key institutions in political economy, that should be ready to stand by and act in times of crisis. There were others too who advocated either an overt mon monetary stimulus or something called helicopter money or other types of monetary intervention in the economy when it's needed. And these include monetarist Milton Friedman, uh, William Boater, he's now at Citibank but he's a renowned economist um, who works in the financial system now, Ada Turner, former chairman of the Financial Services Authority and now um, a senior fellow at INET who wrote repeatedly about overt monetary stimulus and how it can be formulated and applied. And finally, um, there is even a, a more detailed proposal of something called strategic quantitative easing, uh, authored by um, colleagues in the, the New Economic Foundation. And they define institutional structure of this quantitative uh, strategic quantitative easing, how it can be applied, who could be in charge. Um, so it's really not a novel idea. It has been existing in the literature for quite some time. It's just that it came to the fore in this recessionary environment where it's clear that the financial cycle has become longer than the business cycle and also longer than the political cycle. And that is one of the major conclusions, by the way, from the recent report by the Bank for International Settlements and a major political challenge for politicians. The problem with quantitative easing uh, is that it seems to be unclear to what extent it worked. All studies suggest that it does stimulate some growth, but then they diverge in their assessment. Some suggest that it only acts sh in a very short period, short term period of time, uh, initially after it was launched. Um, some studies suggest that it would it, it acted only after it was repeatedly announced to the markets and then the markets acted on expectations. But overall, the major result of this gigantic governmental support to the markets and injection of cash are hordes of cash that are being held by banks and non-bank institutions, non-financial corporations. These are some figures from advanced countries. And uh, they are quite dramatic. There is about 7 trillion of US dollars globally in advanced economies that is essentially cash piles. It seems that the corporations are either unable or unwilling to spend the cash. They also are either unable or unwilling to invest these cash piles into uh, economic projects. Uh, yesterday, uh, John McDonnell, the shadow chancellor, published a letter in The Guardian about the economic vision of um, the Labour Party, where he cites the figure of 400 billion of cash in pounds sterling that is sitting on corporate balance sheets in the UK. And that again, that is quite a substantial figure of unused credit facility. The reasons why corporations and banks are not spending are complex. There are usually two or three being cited. 
and they concern both structural and in more institutional or market conjuncture reasons. This, um, one of the major structural reasons is that economic agents, the markets, don't believe the recovery. In fact, they might know something that is not being very vocalized in, 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 pu in public debates, that the crisis is not over, that there will be another stage of the financial crisis, this time maybe involving other financial <coughs> institutions or maybe other market segments or other countries, but it still hasn't played out. So the expectations are very pessimistic, and when the expectations are pessimistic, they cannot really securely plan for the future, why invest? It's much easier to either borrow or um, uh, flood the so-called repo markets or purchase operation markets in, in, in the city. And um, that's one of the kind of context, uh, big stru structural factors why um, there is unwillingness to invest. In terms of the financial system, um, there, there's been a nuclear bomb thrown into the markets, and that was Basel III. And the overall, it's a very sophisticated, very complex set of regulations, um, which essentially aims to de-risk the financial system, which means that banks are no longer able or willing to go into riskier projects. And uh, as far as their balance sheets are concerned, lending to small and medium-sized enterprises or to the real economic agents is not good for regulatory purposes. They're supposed to hold only very valuable, high, highly liquid assets on their balance sheet, and that includes primarily governmental securities, bonds, guilds, German bonds. It doesn't include corporate bonds, it doesn't inclu include equities, which are considered to be very risky as far as banking regulations are concerned. So. Banks are also not there to lend. And finally, the corporations turned out um, they have borrowed a lot of this cash because the conditions were very flexible and, and very affordable. But ac at least for the data for the USA means that they are not that they're not in a rush to spend it because some of this debt is going to mature quite soon in the next three to five years. So they will have to, um, they cannot sacrifice it to another use. So the major premise for Corbyn's vision for how to make a monetary stimulus work for the real economy rather than banks or corporations um, are, very, are fairly sensible. The QE as it exists now, it hasn't delivered. It hasn't delivered growth um, and instead it produced this unused capacity of non-spent non money. The clearly a different approach is needed to address two major problems behind this unworking quantitative stimulus. General, unspecified injection of liquidity in, in the economy wasn't really tied to any specific project or indeed an asset. It was just pure injection of high-powered money into the economy. The second reason is that crisis management has developed as a big bank approach, but not the big <coughs> government approach. In a kind of Keynesian, post-Keynesian solution to a very dramatic financial crisis, usually you need to have both sides of aggregate demand management, fiscal and monetary um, policy. The monetary policy has been used um, and it has been expanded to the point that central banks now have much more power, they have much more vision, they are much more powerful and much more crucial for economic security. The big state or the big government hasn't been employed as an actor. Comparatively, it has been more employed in the United States where a more flexible approach to governmental deficit has worked to the benefit of the US economy, but it hasn't been really used here in Europe because of austerity politics. But, in formulating an alternative approach to quantitative easing and how it can be used, my major assessment is that it, it, it's all fairly sensible if you try to read beyond the headlines because that it's not that big a deal, it's not even that revolutionary. Although, of course, there is revolutionary spirit in the Labour Party. Uh, as far as I understand, People's QE is supposed to be used not as a continual policy instrument or, or a policy suggestion, but as a policy tool for extreme econo economic circumstances. So, another downturn, a very deep recession, a major structural breakdown of the financial uh, 
and economic system. So it's a tool rather than a policy target or even a program to be launched. People's QE ha would help address this debt trap, the cash pile trap that was uncovered by the crisis. And the most convincing analysis of the consequences and threats of this trap uh, was recently published by the BIS in its annual report for last year. I think it's called when the, Unth when the unthinkable becomes thinkable, <coughs> when financial becomes real. And the major idea is that there are so many risks un unaddressed in the financial cycle that it is the financial cycle now that becomes the real economic condition or cycle. People's quantitative easing would only fund investment but not current deficit. Contrary to some representations in the media, it will be backed by a project or an asset. It will be used f to create facility rather than to fund or to monetize the deficit as it's called. And in, in terms of the instrument that could be used in order to fulfill that, that will be bonds issued by the state and backed by infrastructure or a specific asset. And infrastructure usually gives you that foothold in, in the future rather than a simple promise um, on paper. It's not a debt. There are disagreements, however. Sorry for the speller. The major disagreement, I would say, is ideological and it concerns the inflationary pressure that can arise out of monetizing the deficit, as they understand it. But a lot of post-Keynesians would say um, this is not really a concern for a very deflationary downward context of economic growth, where the economy is not utilized at its full capacity. And full employment here doesn't mean only the labor market. It means <coughs> employment of all the resources. In, there is another disagreement about the institutional arrangement of how to facilitate, how to actually provide for this specific QE. Um, and again, there is a big political argument about what role does the Bank of England um, play in this new system? Uh, can it remain independent? And I believe it can, because there are, um, in fact, a lot of proposals of how such um, kind of a state-directed project can be institutionalized without compromising the independence of the central bank. One suggestion or a point of potential reconciliation comes from two authors who have studied the problems of private sector deleveraging in the wake of financial crisis, and both of whom are very famous for, for their work on shadow banking, another problem that had, been, that had emerged um, in the parallel to the financial crisis. They are saying that, in fact, the optimal policy solution or policy tool for a post-crisis future for ensuring greater economic growth and stimulus is not really one or two sides of the equation, not only monetary policy or fiscal policy, but an optimal balance of how the two arms of the <coughs> state stimulus can interact together. They call it fiscal monetary cooperation as a, as a, as a political term. And they quote somebody that you might recognize on the next slide, who in 2003 argued in, ad in his address to um, Japanese policymakers and business leaders that it is important to recognize that the role of an independent central bank is different in inflationary and deflationary environments. In the face of inflation, which is often associated with excessive monetization, the virtue of an independent central bank is its inability to say no to the government. And that's why it should remain independent. In private deleveraging cycles, however, excessive monetary creation is unlikely to be the problem and a more cooperative stance on the part of the central bank may be called for. Under such circumstances, greater cooperation for a time between central banks and fiscal authorities is in no way inconsistent with the, the, with the independence of the central banks. And that was Ben Bernanke in 2003, some uh, five years before the crisis really became very deep. So. Thank you. I think I'm on time. So really to take us to a more policy oriented or reality oriented debate, the key challenge in translating the language of core binomics to the public, to the students, to some academics, is really about applying a different <coughs> vision of the economy of the 20, to the economy of the 21st century. Um, a lot of academics are writing about financialization. Um, it's a relatively ugly term, but it does mean a lot. It means that you cannot, first of all, you cannot separate macroeconomic phenomenon or fundamentals from the financial system, and you cannot discuss 
anything about the economic growth, about economic recovery, about jobs, um, or even international cooperation without understanding of what role debt plays in contemporary capitalism. And debt plays a very important role in contemporary capitalism because we live in the economy of futurity. At least advanced capitalist countries, advanced de democracies live in the economy of futurity where expectations and future valuations are really the core to how economic agents behave. Ah, I deleted two slides as I was preparing. The, the next two slides were supposed to show you uh, quotes from John Commons, who was a major institutionalist economist in the 1920s, 1930s, who once said that when you do political economy, you no longer study, it's not a science of individual liberty as neoclassical economics would suggest to you. You study the tradability, negotiability, and scarcity of debt. That is the core message of, or the core mission of any political economic arrangements where capital has become a commodity, where capital is an asset that can be traded and valued in the markets. And the problem with this political economy of futurity is that we cannot get rid of debt. The debt is both a burden, as it's mostly seen by the public, but it is, a, it is a valuable financial asset that is at the very heart of investment, spending, infrastructure, and indeed the future. So I think the key challenge for Corbynomics and a any anti-austerity agenda is to twist this conversation from a rather obsolete kind of the status household that needs to be paid off and um, similar um, messages to a more realistic 21st century political economy paradigm. Thank you. So our, um, our second speaker, uh, this is Dr. Sean Holly. He's a fellow here at Fitzwilliam College, um, and his research focuses on macroeconomic modeling and optimal policy <coughs> formulation, focusing on monetary formation. And he also lectures here on monetary policy in Cambridge. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's really interesting that you've created this society because one of the problems with you're, ch you're trying to change things or at least argue things that you're only here for three or four years and it really having a society in place that continues this debate with mainstream <coughs> economics I think is very important. Uh, I, I appreciate what you're trying to achieve. Uh, to be honest, I don't agree with a lot of what you're suggesting, um, maybe because I'm just an old-fashioned uh, neoclassical economist, but nevertheless it's important <coughs> that we have this debate. Right now, um, as usual, the, the title is slightly odd, um, The Solution to Britain's Sorry. Economic Problems. Um, Sorry. I'm just going to get rid of this, but they can't make it go away. No, anyway, sort of hang yeah. about. What, what I'm really going to look at is how thinking is going on within the Labour Party leadership about how you might well change the debate. And I think in many ways, I think that's quite an attractive idea because it, it's certainly true if you went back to the previous general election that the debate in many ways in the economics case is slightly inflexible. There were certain things you weren't really allowed to think about. And I think what's important is it's freeing up a number of ideas which aren't that radical but which have not really been thought about. So I think it's important that we start to do so. Now, of course, um, the current shadow <coughs> chancellor, John McDonnell, um, is a very prominent left-wing Labour MP. And this is what the internet does to you. It, it keeps things. And so back in uh, October of 2012 in a Labour briefing, what used to be called London Labour briefing. Um, he, he basically set out what he imagined it would be like for his sort of Labour government to come to power. And so basically he said, this will give us a taste of what the first 100 days could look like. And I think it's fair to say that three years ago, I'm sure even in his dreams did he ever imagine that three years later he would actually be the shadow chancellor of exchequer. So in many ways, given a lot of what he writes is largely, I think, rhetorical, he's arguing things, I, what's important now is that he has to actually sit down and work through the consequences of the sorts of policies 
he wants to pursue, and that's where the advisory committee, for which Anastasia is one of the members, is very important for helping people to think about in more detail, to, to come up with policies that might well work. And so the first thing he commits himself to is that as soon as the Labour government comes into power, that he wants to abolish or re get rid of the independence of the central bank. And there's always this problem with central banks, is that you are explicitly giving democratic control of interest rates and monetary policy to basically unelected <coughs> economists. So there's always, a, there's always a problem of how you reconcile that with democracy. And so his original proposal here was that we'd take back power. Now, there's lots of arguments say, well, actually, in practice, it's probably best on average to have a central bank, which is independent, because we do know from historical data that on average, over long periods of time, the more independent the central bank is, typically the lower the rate of inflation. The reason for this, in part, is because politicians, like everyone else, get tempted by opportunities of being re-elected, and sometimes they use the inappropriate monetary policy for the economic context. So there are some reasons to say why it is that we should have independent central banks, notwithstanding this democratic problem. But of course, it has to be, it has to also have behind it very transparent mechanisms for understanding exactly on what information central banks are doing what they're doing. In other words, you need a high degree of transparency in what, for example, the Bank of England actually does. And that's typically what they think they are doing. They try and tell people why it is that they're doing things. What's the justification? What is the evidence? So <coughs> he basically commits himself to a, a number of, obviously, affecting the independent central bank, but also changes in taxes. And so this, in, this introduces a much more progressive tax system, especially on the very rich, and also suggesting that there should be an upper limit to wages. Now, when we look at this figure, 20 times seems rather harsh restriction on wages, but it isn't really, because if you thought, for example, that supposing eventually we get the minimum wage to nine pounds an hour, and suppose on average people are working 14 hours a week, then they're earning about 360 pounds a week. Well, if you multiply that by 20, you end up with a salary or in a company of almost 400,000. Now, in the vast majority of companies in this country, no one is paid 400,000. It's obviously true in large multinational corporations that you get very high salaries. But 20 times is actually is a bit high. I think it, you could think about it as being maybe 10 times or even less. So there is it, but anyway, that's a, that's a small point. I think 20 times is a bit, a bit high. Now, despite what I think is the rather intemperate language of the uh, previous shadow chancellor, there's actually rather a number of interesting proposals within what he's saying. And I think very important, this question about how do you address some of the problems associated with <coughs> banks in particular, banks that are too large to fail. And one suggestion is, which was advocated by the John Vickers report a few years ago, simply said that we should separate retail from investment banking. <coughs> so the, the risky part, where often most of the money is made, should be separated completely from the retail side of the bank. And another interesting idea is the so-called financial transactions tax. Again, this is a proposal that <coughs> when th ha things happen in financial markets, that there's, a, there's, a sl there's a small tax on each transaction. But again, this is not a particularly new idea Originally, Maynard Keynes advocated some sort of transactions tax at the beginning of the previous century. And in particular, in 1972, um, James Tobin, at the uh, Elliot Janeway Lectures at Princeton, 
proposed a so-called currency transactions tax. Now this basically says if you, if you buy or sell some equity or a bond, then you pay a small percentage. And at the September G20 2009 meeting, uh, Gordon Brown actually suggested the introduction of a financial transactions tax. And what we eventually found was that um, the European Union then looked at the possibility of introducing a financial transactions tax and they eventually committed themselves to actually starting next January the 1st. So there's a number of European states who've committed themselves to introducing a financial tra transactions tax. But it turns out, as a result of meetings, I think, last week, it looks like the introduction of the financial transactions tax would not come until the middle half of 2017. So already that there's a lot of debate going on about having a financial transactions tax. But again, it's got a new name, but in fact, we've, we've always had, or pretty much for a long time, had a financial transactions tax in the UK. It's called stamp duty. We have stamp duty on the purchasing of houses, but in particular, we also have stamp duty in the transaction selling and sh buying shares. <coughs> you pay a transaction tax of 0.5%. So again, it's not a new idea. But where, of course, it is different is it not simply with respect to the buying and selling of shares of equity, but it also in particular refers to so-called derivatives. It, it refers to uh, the arbitrage processes that go on around the world 24 hours a day. This is so-called high-frequency trading, where it could have quite a significant and possibly beneficial effect. We're trying to slow down or put sand into the motor by introducing a financial transactions tax. And the, the amount of <coughs> revenue that the UK government gets from the current stamp duties is less than 1% of total UK revenues, tax revenues. Whereas in Taiwan, ta Taiwan actually raises between 5 and 8% of its revenues actually from this sort of tax. It fluctuates between 5 and 8% depending upon the state of the financial markets. So it's not an impossible thing to introduce. But of course it's not going to be at the moment, well it's not going to be introduced in London and there is an interesting question here about how the financial markets in Europe will react and will they move m most of their business to London. To make it work properly, of course, you've got to have a worldwide cooperation in having the taxation to apply to everybody. So there's no incentives to move these transactions to some small country. So to make it work properly, but even though, but it still seems to be the case that we has, we've had stamp duty in the UK and as far, we still have the one of the largest, or perhaps the largest, financial centre in the world, despite stamp duty. So it does seem to me that there are opportunities to raise potentially quite large amounts of money by introducing a financial transactions tax. So we got to this point where um, the shadow chancellor has told us what he's going to do, but now at the, in practice he's, he's, he's never been really involved in designing policies to actually have to work. Now as Ch Ch Shadow <coughs> Chancellor he has to think about how he can design policies that actually work. And so I think it, every policy we propose and every economic investment we use will be rigorously examined before it is introduced in government. The foundations of our economic policy are prosperity, and social justice endorsed by world leading economic thinkers. Of course, many of the world leading economic thinkers on the panel are actually old fashioned uh, neoclassical economists, but there's no harm in that. If you read Joe Stiglitz's uh, textbooks on uh, macro and micro, it's just pretty much what we teach standard macro and micro. Now, but what we're starting to get is, is some clarification, and Anastasia has already said a number of things about this on some issues. The first thing is now, instead of abolishing the central bank, I think the shadow chancellor has been persuaded that's not 
necessarily a good idea. So there's going to be a, a, a mandate. And again, that makes a lot of sense because the, the, the current mandate where the Bank of England is committed to a so-called inflation target, that's now been around for almost 20 years. And you think, well, maybe we should think again about how it should be done. And one, there's a number of suggestions. One is, well, instead of having the Bank of England focus almost entirely, well, largely upon the inflation rate, they also have to bring into, bring into operation other possible <coughs> objectives of policy. Now, in practice, if you look at what at least the <coughs> Bank of England has been doing, and also the Federal Reserve Board, the European Central Bank is a little bit more difficult. That's effectively what they have been doing. There's no situation in which the Bank of England acts like an inflation nutter with a sole concentration upon the inflation rate target. They have to take into account what else is going on in the economy. And you can see that in particular over the last few years when the inflation rate 2012-13 went up to 5%. If the Bank of England was an inflation nutter, they should have been raising interest rates. Interest rates remained at 0.5%. And the reason they didn't raise interest rates is because they were aware of what that would do to output and to employment. So in practice, most central banks are aware of the larger policy implications of what they do. Now th then it comes to this question of so-called <coughs> people's quantitative easing. In many ways, I think echoing what Anastasia also said, it it's now been made clear that there are situations in which you might want to use this different type of quantitative easing, <coughs> and that's in a crisis. It cannot, it cannot be used as a regular method of financing expenditures because it would be inflationary. But there are circumstances, as Anastasia has described, when, as it happened in 2009, and the wor world economy collapsed, the banking system collapsed. In those circumstances, there could be advantages to using that sort of different quantitative, quantitative easing. Now, the, w one of the problems with that, of course, is that if you, want to, if you want to back it up with infrastructure, there's a big problem associated with timing. And you'd, you'd almost what you'd need to have is a, is a pile of so-called shovel-ready projects that you've already got everything ready for that you could then use quickly to get going. Because the time it takes to plan and do everything, the recession would be over. So there is a problem if you want to back it up with infrastructure investment in roads or schools or whatever, then you really have got to have in place the ability to make that happen almost instantaneously. The other alternative, which if you like is something that um, Obama did in the US, was instead of funding investment, you temporarily cut taxes. This is not quite helicopter money, but it's necessarily a very quick way in which you can offset the consequences of a deep recession by temporarily reducing tax rates. You basically gave every household $1,000. So again, that's another way in which you could respond to those periods of particular crisis. Now, the, 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 next, the next issue is the um, fiscal balance. I think there's a, there's a lot of ridiculous argument that's been going on about the, uh, the current <coughs> Chancellor's Exchequer dreaming up this idea that come 2020 that we should run a, a surplus on the current account. There's, there's absolutely no reason to do that. And in particular, there's no reason why you should pass a law to make it compulsory. All that you simply want is to, a slow adjustment back to some sort of f basic fiscal balance and then the, then the processes of reducing the total debt of the economy would happen over time. Because again, when you raise the debt income ratio of around about 80%, it's too high. It's too high in the sense that there's, a, there's an intergenerational problem. These funds that are borrowed have ultimately to be paid back. And those paying it back are yourselves and your children. So there is an intergenerational question here about how we deal in the long run 
with this big increase in debt income ratios for most governments around the world. But you don't rush at it, you know, again, and I'm sure in practice, come 2020, the current Charles Exchequer would not have achieved the objectives. But I think I'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs> I did actually have, there isn't time, I did have actually some extra stuff as well because I'm, we've been talking about problems then. Clearly one of the problems is inequality, both in the distribution of income, but also in the distribution of the benefits of being well off. And I think those are the main, I would think that's the major economic problem the UK economy faces, is the inequality issues. So both in both in terms of income and in terms of opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if you that, I'll turn it um, Let's take a seat then. So does anyone have a question for uh, either of them? Yeah, yes, Rachel. Yeah, uh, by Alistair. Um, <coughs> so I was just wondering why, rather than fund infrastructure through QE, why, the, why isn't it just done through this good fund? Is there some like, institutional reason for that or some legal reason according to EU law or something? Well, that is one of the arguments again that you'll hear. I'm sorry, is that question? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the reasons why you saying, well, given that interest rates are so low, that actually if, if it was decided that you could borrow more in order to fund infrastructure investment, then why not just do it in the conventional way? Because interest rates are so low. If if you thought it was sensible to increase borrowing, the, the trick is that it can be used both as an investment facility and also as a financial injection instrument if you need to stimulate the demand. Um, you're right to say that there are already bonds being issued or being backed by the state. They're called social investment bonds. Mm -hmm. And they're specifically targeted to very particular social goals rather than profit or any very economic project. They're prison bonds or something. My PhD student is doing work on that. So it's not, again, it's not a radically new idea, but the, 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 the trick is that a debt instrument is necessarily both a twofold asset, or if you want, facility, when it's being issued. One is you can create the productive capacity, but on the other hand, what if you're not then kind of the, the, the issue is to join fiscal and monetary arms together. And that particular uh, formula allows it to Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, so in regards to inflation, I mean, we have plenty of historical examples where government expenditure was funded by monetization, including here during the Second World War in the US and Japan after the war and during the war and so on. <coughs> But in all these cases, the money that was entering the economy in order to fund, say, war production was then being mopped out of the economy by the issuance of bonds or by stimulating savings. Because if you get the money in, but all the goods are produced, say, weapons or whatever, you have more money but not more products, so that would, uh, go, the price would go through the roof. But the methods that were used to mop up this were either the issuance of war bonds or the stimulation of savings, financial repression, uh, the denial of consumption <coughs> credit, and so on. Today, though, uh, these, I mean, a number of these things, A, would possibly be forbidden by EU law, uh, and others are still outside of what is talked, even though we've had an expansion of, of, of what we can imagine as, as appropriate policy. Uh, so on top of that, if this were to stimulate the economy, all the cash files that you mentioned might start getting activated. Uh, so while I'm certainly not kind of saying that we have the simple, you know, quantity theory of money, more money, especially reserves which are not you know, getting into prices, I do see the problem of inflation as something that has to be considered far more seriously and appropriate policies thought of in advance and institutions which would control it. Uh, I, I don't think it's something that, I mean, there is certainly a lot of ideological uh, resistance to it, but I think there, there needs to be considered in a far more practical manner as well. It's not some sort of just an ideological issue. So yeah, I'd just like to hear your comments on that. <coughs> Oh, even from both of you. <coughs> Can I refer to, again, William Boiter, who was um, 
talking at one of the city events a few weeks ago. And when uh, asked a very similar question about inflationary <coughs> dangers of this overt monetary stimulus, he said that, well, there are lots of countries in the world that have applied it, but there are very <coughs> few Zimbabwe's. So there are institutional <coughs> mechanisms in place in Britain and in other advanced economies that would prevent that inflation being translated into a hyper pressure. And again, the, the biggest danger for a very indebted economy is deflation, it's not inflation because with deflation your debt becomes more expensive. It's much more difficult to repay, especially when the economy is slowing down. How are you going to, to even manage? So <coughs> it's, um, you, you mentioned ideological, it's almost theological kind of divide in economic debate, uh, but I don't think inflation is, is really a priority to be argued. Well, in, in, the, in the First World War, I think there was a very large increase in inflation. And then after that, there was a major collapse in the price of But I think quite deliberately in the Second World War, they, they tried to think about what policies they should use, especially increasing taxes and also selling bonds, moderating the cost of inflation consequences. And the, the big difference was between the First World War and the second world war that was under the guidance of Cage, so we very much thinking about this as the ones you took away. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Josh. I just want to say, you know, I love Jeremy Corbyn, thank you, Sarah. John McDonald, great guy as well. I guess my question is, um, you know, inequality is, I guess, the defining economic challenge of the 21st century, and we need to find a way to make sure the economy can address these issues. I guess my uh, problem is that even with quantitative easing, it's good, but, you know, the money has to come from somewhere, and eventually, you know, that will still end up hurting the people. And even when you try to introduce high levels of tax on, you know, the wealthiest, eventually, you know, they'll hop up and go to another country where taxes are low. I mean, I remember when Francois Hollande was, you know, first elected, he's like, I'm going to introduce like a, something like an 80 or 90 percent tax rate, and then the rich people all pray for the, so that was dropped. So I guess my question is, you know, should we really uh, continue to guarantee, like, the independence of bank and Should we more or less, you know, control them so we can actually make sure they follow through on, you know, or adopt a new mandate to uh, lessen income inequality? And also about these issues of, you know, these cash piles sitting on corporate balance sheets, was like 400 billion. I mean, now I'm not saying, you know, we should have a full glorious communist revolution, but uh, shouldn't we kind of like seize this money so we can actually reinvest it and actually help the working people of this country? Because as, you know, the way things going, you know, inequality is just going to, you know, widen and widen and widen and widen and widen. And I guess that's really my question, and that any of you can pick that up anyway. <laughs> Inequality is, is clearly there. If we think in terms of income, it, it hasn't why it hasn't got more and more. It hasn't got bigger. But undoubtedly, if you compare, say, the, the 1970s to the 1990s, then undoubtedly there was in the UK there was a major increase in inequality of incomes, and that's true for most countries around the world. Now, and so it's not. You can't rely upon the Bank of England to sort out inequality. That's not what the Bank of England is capable of doing. That's not what it's designed to do. But if you want to do something about inequality, again, not again with respect to income, but also to opportunity, it does seem to suggest a lot of uh, a lot of recent research by economists in the U.S. suggests that the importance of targeting um, opportunities on the youngest, in other words, it's it's very important to look at three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. If you leave it till they're 17, it has no effect. If you, if, you can, if you can sort stuff out when they're very young and give them opportunities, education and other things, then that has a long-run effect on their lives. So it seems to me that you need to think about how you can target opportunities, which of course means expenditure and of course means higher taxes. But it's nothing to do with the Bank of England. It's to do with the sorts of social policies that the government pursues. The question about independence of the central bank, it's, it tends to be overplayed in, in commentary because when you look at what they have done during the crisis, they, they have themselves stopped being independent. They have taken a variety of issues into consideration planning policies, so de facto they, 
they, they're not independent. Bernanke was quite open in his in various speeches that in certain circumstances, which is an extraordinary time now, the central bank has to look at jobs and fiscality. So it's not uh, it's not that revolutionary. To what extent it can be directly used to fight poverty, I guess I, I would agree with that. That it's not the, the institution to do, or not the only institution to do that. Uh, in terms of the challenge of inequality, the problem is it's, it's structural. There is quite a, a big risk that there will be now two generations of young people in this country who would be worse off than their parents. And that presents not just economic challenge, but a political security challenge. What are you going to do with, with people who don't have uh, essentially a, a, a future that they can they have aspired to? Um, it's also a problem that is sort of get masked by asset valuation, but it, it's not necessarily inequality as such, but it's the ownership of the top 0.1% to 1%. And, and this financial wealth currently, the value of assets under professional management globally yields $75 trillion. $75 trillion is simply assets that are being digested or created by the financial system for the high net worth individuals, also institutional investors and others. Um, the Global Wealth Report forecasts that in the next five years, global wealth is going to grow by 40 to 50 percent, the stock of assets. You can say it's a bubble, but it's an important bubble because it is through those valuations that debt that we all have, student loans, mortgages, securitized mm -hmm. products that are getting out of our commitments get digested as a financial <coughs> security. So it's not it's not a separable problem from the legacy of the financial crisis. Um, a social policy create addressing the structural issues, and it's not only internal; it's also international. That will be very important. Um, not, not to like that, but can we truly ever fix? I mean, I guess you know. Because obviously the structures, you know, they're inbuilt into kind of capitalism. I think, you know, even when we try to reform it, the problems are still going to be there. And obviously, you know, moving into a kind of like a just one conception of how we should kind of organise the state. Uh, I'm just wondering whether we can truly address these problems with the means we have available within capitalism, or should we try to move beyond it? Well, one answer I can give you, it's a quote from a colleague of mine who is also a commentator for um, lots of your books. Um, there are many indicators used in economic growth, prosperity, human development, and usually in those tables there, are, there is a group of countries that win whichever indicator you develop. And these are the social democracies of Scandinavia, part of the world. And that could be one reason. It, it is an economy of high tax, but it's also an economy of flexible opportunities, <coughs> reliable state, which is more or less controlled financial systems, although they had their bubbles and crisis before. So that is sort of capitalism, but it's a particular form of one state of capitalism. We used to call this the so-called mixed economy. As you say, there are a number of countries where the amount of the economy that's in the public sector is much larger than, say, in Scandinavian countries than it is, for example, in the US or Japan or many other countries. So, so, the, so the question is, well, you could, you could argue, argue democratically about how mixed you want the economy to be. And, but the question is, well, what, what, what's beyond capitalism? Well, unfortunately we had, a, we had a, an experiment in the last century which didn't work very well. And so I think it's a major intellectual challenge there to say, well, going that particular s s state socialism or state communism, simply doesn't work. And so we have to think very carefully. Well, if we think there is something that's better, we need to we need to come up with it. I don't think at the moment we can see anything that's that's better. That would be my view. Um, we have one more short question. And 
I'm still trying to get my head around what, what the true meaning of a strong economy is and why it, it's a complete <coughs> lie. But how, not, I suppose part of it is, I guess maybe I'm coming from a lower baseline than other people in the audience, but I'm sort of, it seems to me as if how the economy actually works and what a strong economy would be and how the Conservatives are talking about it is the two completely different things. But ha and so I'm wondering if you comment on how we've arrived at that situation where the kind of public understanding of the, the public's ability to understand the economy is so far removed from the actual reality of the economy and how we could maybe move forward from it. I think, I think the first thing is clearly what the Conservative Party is doing in terms of, again, of the mixed economy. They want a much smaller state. Mm -hmm. They're very clear about that. Whereas, whereas under the under the previous uh, government of Tony Blair, um, quite explicitly, they went for a much larger um, mixed economy, more, more state, by major investments in education and hospitals. And I know Tony Blair is not very really popular in many parts of the Labour Party anymore. We should not forget, it, and obviously for rightful reasons, with respect to the Iraqi war, but nevertheless, those things were done explicitly to increase the amount of the economy which came from the public sector, came from health, education, and also pension. And I think that's right. But let's go back to now, let's go back to what we mean by the claim that the UK economy is, is stronger. Well, unfortunately it is, in the following sense. But if you look at the, if you look at growth in GDP since the bottom of the, uh, the recession in 2009, then the UK has grown up to the current quarter around about 13%. I mean, that's miserable, to be honest. But if you look at the US, the US has grown broadly from the same point in 2009 by around about 13%. If you look at Germany, Germany has also risen by around about 13%. Whereas if you go to France or Italy or many other countries within Europe, you get a much, much lower recovery. And that's shown up in um, falling unemployment, both in the US and the UK. So in that, sort of, <coughs> in that sort of sense, those are indications of success. But again, it's relatively meaty because we also know that there's been a major step change with, with, with a fall in 2009-2010 in gross domestic product, which it looks like we're never going to be able to get back to those previous levels of output. So it does look as if the growth rate of the economy is going back to what it was for the last 50 years in the UK. But we, we, we never seem to be able to get back to the original level of GDP. There is one reason why we cannot, or why these comparisons are inevitably more pessimistic now. There are 6 million more people in the UK, so GDP per capita is inevitably lower than it was pre crisis. So again, regardless of what the Tories were, talking about for now two, um, what is it, parliaments, they, um, you know, the net migration into the country has increased. So that was that is one reason. But in terms of why, you know, you, you asked this interesting question, why the public is so ready buying this argument. Uh, I would say it's partly educational and academic, this divorce between the economic re reality of the 21st century, which is very debt dependent in any shape or form that you can. You cannot, you cannot destroy that. You can make it productive, you can make it negotiable, you can make it cheaper or expensive, but you cannot get rid, get rid out of it or get out of it. Um, and with this reality, you need to have a strong standby institution able and willing to ensure this is, these mechanisms of net, debt negotiability, and it's only the state. So a reduced state with a reduced involvement, sort of the nice, what is it, the, the economy of shopkeepers and farmers, mm -hmm. that is a uh, Thatcher. It's a, uh, it's absolutely, it has no viable function, or it does it, it, to a marginal extent, but it, it is not a strategically competitive position to be as a major advanced uh, you know, OECD member economy in a financialized type of capitalism. Emotionally, however, what, what they're doing and, and why it's so easy to vote for austerity is that households have suffered as a result of the crisis. The only group that wasn't affected in terms of their income reduction by 2009 
are the over 55s. Everybody else is in, is in one queue and left over. So it seems like this is you know, our common problem. We have to tighten our belts. Of course the state has to tighten its belt and sign the fiscal charter by 2020. But it's, uh, there is very little there beyond the motion of this idea that we're together. In fact, once the state stops borrowing as a public institution, the borrowing will have to be done by private corporations and households, which is exactly what got, what got us into 2007 crisis in the first place. And this is not what you would hear on um, public debates by the Tories. They're not telling you that this is the consequence of the due state. So what is, is there real gender if it's not actually... Production of the state, production of the welfare state. Or rather, shifting the state function to now private sector for ideological reasons. And if you want to paint a very extreme picture, creating oligarchies, because these will be monopolies who are subcontracted by the state to manage the services. So, in terms of the narrative around debt, how so, can you have a, sorry, a positive, what, what, why is that necessary and positive? Well? Because it's also credit. Okay, I, well, I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not entirely sympathetic with this credit idea. This idea of credit has been running in economics for a number of years. And if you go back to Karl Marx, when there was a lot of emphasis then about the importance of credit in driving business cycles, he, he, he said it was completely wrong. I mean, in many ways, you could think of Karl Marx almost as a real business cycle. Because, but these weren't important. What, what mattered for driving business cycles, the, the, the optimism of entrepreneurs and then their peasants, and it was nothing to do with credit the credit markets simply reflected the cycle that was not itself the primary determinant of the cycle. Now, having said that, there is some interesting uh, empirical work that's been done recently where uh, it's possible I might be wrong on that. It does seem as if, when you look at the financial cycle, that actually that, that does seem to have some predictability. This work by Taylor and others. Yeah, but but my, my, my feeling is that I'm, I'm not so happy with this credit cycle. We've always had it. It's, um, I can feel people getting quite restless, so I'm going to suggest that if people have questions, they come up to the front and we can discuss it all. Um, okay. oh, we'll take one more, we'll answer it very quickly. Oh, sorry. Um, the gentleman. They sit on the balance sheet of the central bank. All those trillions of dollars just sit there. So it's, it's in a sense, it's, it's almost an outing. Yeah, if you go this in and I buy a house and I default on it, you're out, you're out of pocket. But these trillions, if we default on, let's say we suggest we do, if we default on those trillions, who's out of pocket? Well, we, we, we can't default because it's a central bank. No, 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 it's a hypothetical question. I need to know where the balance is. We know who the credit is. We know, we know we're, we're, we're borrowed money, we're in credit, we're getting the benefit of it. Who are the people who are providing that? What's the central bank? The Martians. That's not a decision. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually, so, sorry, two, two. Put it in some global perspective. perspective. That doesn't add up. There is work done by a lot of people at the World Bank and the MF. The world as a whole is running a deficit with apparently the moon or somewhere out there. Because according to accounting, all these debts and credit have to cancel each other out in the global economy. In the global economy is a closed system. But it doesn't. It never does. There is usually a deficit. And they struggle to explain it. They talk it. They but these are measurement errors. No, well, that's the major theory why. Yes, that's the theory why. The liabilities must be equal to the assets. Well, that's, that's, that's an accounting relationship. Red balance sheets, and it's an interesting point. All I can say is that originally, when reading some of the early the economists, I'm uh, a the late person in this area, I, we hear about trying to identify value, value of goods and services, value of production, 
effort. And then suddenly we're talking about money, and it, you might as well be playing just gambling. It, just, it doesn't link to real value in the same sense as we got this. Tremendous debt, we're all naughty boys, we, we spend beyond our means, but it's not a household. If I borrowed from somebody, I paid them back. I mean, that's, that's the man in the street understands that. He doesn't understand that the balance sheet where it says we can have debt which we must pay back, but we don't owe it to anybody. I thought you were going to say something like, we owe it all to the Arab states, or we, we owe it all to the the pension fund, but you didn't say that. You said well, I think again, we need to distinguish between the balance sheet of the central banks and whether or not when the government is seeking to finance expenditures, it does it through taxes or it borrows. If it, if it sells bonds, then if it sells 10-year bonds, then it's got to pay that back. Well, I understand that. that, you know, that's, that's... But again, but the, but the central bank balance sheet, in a sense, is a, is a slight illusion. It's just... It's just accounting. And it would say when eventually we move out of quantitative easing, the balance sheets will go back to what we were before. Well, exactly. If that's how economies work, no wonder nobody understands them. <laughs> <laughs> I share that with you, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close then. As I said, if you have any more questions, like, please come up to the front and we can discuss them then. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.